So the 2021 through 22 NBA season is now just a few short weeks away. And with us now finally being able to get a good look at what all 30 NBA teams will look like this year, I thought now was the perfect time to make my standings predictions for this season. In this video, we'll break down where I think all 15 Western Conference teams will fall in the standings. And then just a few days from now, we'll get into the Eastern Conference, so be sure to stick around for that. A big shout out to my guy Alvini Linguini for joining me on this video. He's gonna jump in and add some of his thoughts a little later in the video, so again, thank you to him. And by the way, this video descended into chaos by the end, so sorry for that. At number 15, I have the Oklahoma City Thunder. Shea Gilgis Alexander is probably gonna have a fantastic season. Lou Dort is always fun, and Josh Giddy has looked promising in the preseason. But we all know that this team is still deep into tank mode and isn't gonna accomplish anything anytime soon. At number 14, and this may be surprising to some, but I have the San Antonio Spurs. It's really weird putting a team like the Spurs this low, since the last time they were a 14th seed was in 1997, when DeJounte Murray wasn't even born yet. But the team was only winning 30-ish games before they lost DeMar DeRozan, Rudy Gay, and of course, LaMarcus Aldridge. Now, the roster is pretty bare bones. I can see DeJounte Murray putting up 25-5 and five this season, and I even expect the likes of Derek White, Lonnie Walker, and especially Keldon Johnson to all improve this season. But this is also the only team in the West with no actual star. At number 13, I have the Houston Rockets just barely edging out San Antonio. I expect Christian Wood to make his first ever All-Star team this year, and obviously Jalen Green's presence will get the team a couple extra wins. Kevin Porter Jr. could also be fun, but I honestly still view him as a wild card given how little we've seen of him. With the exception of these three very young players that are just barely starting to find themselves, this roster has pretty much nothing. John Wall is a whole mess right now, and the rest of the roster is genuinely filled with a bunch of no-names. At number 12, I have the Sacramento Kings. With a core of De'Aaron Fox, Buddy Heald, Tyrese Halliburton, Harrison Barnes, Marvin Bagley, and the extremely underrated Rashawn Holmes, Sacramento is far from bad, but the West is just way too stacked. Fox is gonna need another star by his side if they really want to contend for a playoff spot. Also, by the way, during that 2018 NBA draft when Marvin Bagley was drafted, I remember watching it live and saying, that dude is gonna be a bust. I know nothing about him, but he was drafted by the Kings, so he's gonna be terrible. And oh my god, I was correct. At number 11, I have the Minnesota Timberwolves. Carl Anthony Towns has desperately needed a second star next to him ever since Jimmy Butler's departure, and Anthony Edwards is quickly becoming that great second option he's been waiting for. I see Edwards becoming one of this year's biggest all-star snubs, and I also think that this year will be the one that Malik Beasley will actually be healthy for and prove to the world just how much of a three-point sniper he truly is. A lot of their young guys still need a few more years of development, plus their defense still has to improve drastically. But Minnesota will consistently be making the playoffs just a few years from now, unless they really screw something up. Which is actually probably gonna happen, they are the Timberwolves. Number 10 is gonna be the Memphis Grizzlies. I'm not as hyped about Ja Morant as others are, and honestly, I don't think he'll make an all-star team. But I really like Jaron Jackson. Jr., and with his quirky, versatile playstyle, I see the sky being the limit for him. This team traded Jonas Valanciunas for Steven Adams, which was pretty stupid, and they also made no significant gains this offseason, so the only way I see them making the playoffs is by winning the playoffs.
play in tournaments, which is always possible. At number 9, I have the New Orleans Pelicans. New Orleans is still a very dysfunctional organization, and the duo of Zion and Brandon Ingram is still a very awkward fit. But at some point, the sheer star power of Zion Williamson is going to propel this team into the playoffs year after year. Maybe he can't quite do that in just year number 3, but it'll happen very soon. New Orleans also mercilessly stole Jonas Valanciunas from the Grizzlies, who is not only better than Steven Adams, but will also space out the floor more to give Zion more room to work. This is gonna be the last year that the Pelicans don't make the playoffs in a while. At number 8, I have the Portland Trailblazers. I had to think long and hard about whether or not the Blazers were gonna make the playoffs, since this offseason they said goodbye to the likes of Innis Cantor, Derek Jones Jr., and Carmelo Anthony, and only really got back Larry Nance Jr. in return for all these losses. But the fact still remains, Damian Lillard still is indeed Damian Lillard. And can you really see him letting his team miss the playoffs? If you are still doubting Lillard's ability to carry a team, then you must have been living under a rock for the past five plus years. I also am a very big fan of Robert Covington, and a core of him, Nurkic, CJ McCollum, and Norman Powell isn't awful. At number 7, I put the Los Angeles Clippers, and for the Clippers, I thought it would only be right to hit up the biggest, most depressed Clippers fan I know to talk about this team. Alvini Linguini, how's your team looking this year? The Los Angeles Clippers, just just full of confusing stuff, I'm gonna be honest with you. As a longtime Clippers fan, I can tell you right now that this season is gonna be full of uncertainty even though there's been a lot of optimism with a lot of people. I can tell you right now, Paul George is definitely going to be a dark horse MVP candidate just because the carry job he's going to have to do and how he's probably going to redeem himself for after what happened in the last postseason, even though most of it wasn't his fault, but that's neither now or then. But I can tell you right now, things are going to be a lot harder this season. We do we are not following the system that we usually have, which is just basically spacing out. We have a lot of three-point shooters. We have added people like Eric Bledsoe, who I'm sure is going to be good for the now, but I don't think he's going to be good in the playoffs due to his bad reputation when it comes to choking in the playoffs. Of course, we added non-shooters like Isaiah Hartenstein and Justice Winslow for some reason. And then we went out and got four rookies. Four of them. I, I just don't understand what the plan is right now because... I don't really see ourselves as like a championship team unless we go like eight people deep in the playoffs. We still have the same problems with Serge Ibaka getting injured all the time. We're not going to have to rely on Ivaka Zubac to play heavy minutes. We don't have a backup center unless you talk about like Isaiah Hartenstein being one who I don't want to see on that fucking court. And then we also have people like Boogie who's not even on our team anymore who would have came back for cheap. This is a lot of uncertainty. I've been telling people right now that I see ourselves as like a low like playing team to like potentially like a seventh or like six seed but unless paul george decides to go out there and average like 30 points tonight i'm not very optimistic about how this is going to turn out unless everybody just buys in or terrence man turns into the most improved player or something but other than that thank you for having me on in this video and uh go clippers until we blow another 3-1 lead or be down 2-0 in the playoffs again in every single series Thank you again to Alvini for that contribution. Quite frankly, I couldn't have put it better myself. And low-key, this might be the year that my Knicks end up better than your Clippers, Alvini. But that's a discussion for another day. At number 6, I have the Phoenix Suns. Last year, I genuinely believed that Phoenix was going to win the NBA championship, and this was well before they had even beaten the Clippers in the conference finals. But if there's one thing we know about the NBA, it's that things change very quickly. Just ask 2018 All-Star DeMarcus Cousins. Chris Paul is officially an old ass man, and I think this is the year that he starts to look really old, like Steve Nash Lakers old. A big three of Booker, Ayton, and Mikal Bridges, who will likely make a big leap this year, is still good enough to lead this team into the playoffs, and as long as he stays healthy, Chris Paul definitely will not be completely useless, but I'd say that Phoenix's championship window is officially closed. 
At number 5, I have the Dallas Mavericks. I think this is going to be Kristaps Porzingis' redemption season, and he and Luka are finally gonna figure things out together. This year will also be the year that Luka Doncic grows up and evolves from being called the future of the NBA to becoming the present. Luka is my MVP pick for this year, but also a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's no other true stars outside of him and maybe Porzingis on this roster. Uh, don't get me wrong, I like Tim Hardaway Jr. and the addition of Reggie Bullock was one that broke my heart as a Knicks fan, but this team is going to have to make way bigger moves than just that to become legit contenders. Plus, the hiring of Jason Kidd was a really weird move, and it's totally possible that he messes this entire team up. At number 4, I have, wait for it, the Los Angeles Lakers. Everybody is getting hyped over the Lakers due to the fact that they made the biggest offseason moves. They signed Russell Westbrook, Carmelo Anthony, Dwight Howard, Rajon Rondo, and DeAndre Jordan. And those are just 5 of the 14 new names joining this team this year. There is no way that this team is going to mesh at all, especially because it's clear as day that they they just went for the biggest names available and didn't even consider fit at all. Now you may argue, oh, but Kagostimus, super teams like Kevin Durant's Warriors or uh, Kevin Durant's Nets never had any issues with getting their stars to play well together. Fit is completely overhyped. And to that, I say, yeah. Some super teams are so good that you don't even have to worry about fit. Just watch any all-star game. The players fit in perfectly because they're just all so good. The Nets legitimately resemble an all-star team. The Lakers, I'm not too sure about. Other than Anthony Davis, every big name on this team is well past their prime. They're just not talented enough of players to just walk into the building and instantly mesh with one another. Just look at every super team ever that didn't happen to be quite as talented as the Warriors or Nets, the Carmelo Anthony Thunder, the Kyrie Irving Celtics, the Chris Paul Rockets. Fit is always an issue, and those teams weren't as horrendously constructed as the Lakers. Those teams didn't have to worry about dividing point guard minutes between LeBron James, Russell Westbrook, Rajon Rondo, and Kendrick Nunn. That that is laughable. And even with all of the big names that LA signed, since they didn't consider fit, their starting lineups are probably still gonna feature some very mediocre players like Wayne Ellington or Trevor Ariza. Also, just a quick side note, there's a guy on this roster named Travelin Queen, so I think he'll fit in pretty well with this team. The Lakers are gonna have a few very rough months to start off the year. LeBron probably probably won't be healthy all season, and maybe some players have to get waived or moved around. But it is possible that they will be able to figure things out come playoff time and could very well win the championship. Don't get me wrong, I understand that. Remember, a team's record and a team's performance in the playoffs are two very different things. This team is definitely a contender, more so than a bunch of the teams that I have ranked above them. I just don't think their record will be all all that good. At number 3, I have the Denver Nuggets. If Jamal Murray was going to be healthy all season, then I would have easily put this team in the number 1 spot. But unfortunately, he's set to miss a pretty good chunk of the season. But aside from that, not only do you have a hungry reigning MVP in Nikola Jokic, but you also have Michael Porter Jr., who I expect to run away with the most improved player trophy after putting up a stat line of, at minimum, 25 and 9. I really like this team, but a starting 5 with Facundo Campazzo in it can only really get you so far. And other than Jokic and MPJ, there are no other players on this team who will get this team 20 points in 5 games all season. 
At number 2, I had this year's wildcard team in the Golden State Warriors. The Warriors are essentially exactly the same team that we all got to know and hate in their early championship days. And yet, simultaneously, it feels as if this team's record is one of the hardest to predict. There were some weird gap years in between this one where the core was either injured, falling off, or not even on the team at all. But now, Steph, Clay, Draymond, and Igudala are finally all back and ready to go. Hell, even Steve Kerr, Kevon Looney, and Sean Livingston are still here in Golden State. This was the core that won 73 games, let's not forget that. Of course, other than Curry, everybody else in this big four has fallen off. But the presence of Andrew Wiggins, James Wiseman, who I do expect to improve, and the up-and-coming star Jordan Poole, who can get this team 14 or 15 15 points off the bench makes this not really a big problem. Clay Thompson's future is of course still up in the air, but honestly with his style of play, I expect him to be able to shoot and score just as well as he did before the injury, with the only part of his game being truly affected being his defense and quickness. Draymond Green always plays better alongside a bunch of stars, so he might have a big year this year, he's not even that old, so who knows. This this team is way more talented than the Nuggets, plus they don't have to deal with learning how to play alongside one another the way that the Lakers will. Their bench rotation makes sense, the players are good, this is going to be a big year for Golden State. And finally, at number one, somehow, the fucking Jazz. Listen, I hate the Jazz. They're the same damn team every single year, they will never win a championship, and oh my god are they boring. But listen, they always have a really good regular season record. Last year, Utah was the number one seed in the extremely competitive Western Conference, and nobody even noticed. So let's not overplay what I'm saying here when I say that I think they will be the number one seed. With that being said, they did have to do something right to get this honor, and honestly, their bench depth is very, very good. This offseason, they added Rudy Gay, Eric Pascal, and Hassan Whiteside, and the duo of Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert is indeed still pretty elite. But most importantly of all, this team has very little flaws. The Lakers have big time fit issues, the Nuggets are are injured, the Warriors are old, and the Jazz, well, they simply exist. Congratulations to the Utah Jazz for getting the number one seed simply because, well, someone had to get it. Thank you all for watching, tell me why I'm stupid in the comments below, subscribe if you have a heart and feel bad for me who had to make this entire stupidly long video just for the conclusion to be the Utah Jazz getting the number one seed, and again, remember to check out Alvini Linguini's channel. Again, thank you to him for hopping on this atrocity of a video, his link will be in the description, although hopefully y'all already know who he is, because if not, you're missing out. And of course, as as always, stay safe out there. Oh yeah, and sorry if you can't comprehend what I said for the last like five minutes of this video. This was so long, I- oh my god, my voice. My voice will never recover. Please, subscribe for my voice. One- one subscribe, one subscribe is one prayer for my voice, which will never recover. Oh my god.